Good morning and welcome to St Chad's service on the 29th of November, the first Sunday of Advent. And today we're going to light our first candle and we do this each of the four Sundays in Advent to symbolise the light of God coming into the world through the birth of his son Jesus. The first candle we light today symbolises hope and it's in remembrance of the prophets and the patriarchs. This gives us an opportunity to reflect the way the birth of the Messiah was foretold. So if you wish to join in with the words in bold as we light the candle, please do. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was present with God in the beginning. Everything was created through him, nothing not one thing came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, full of grace and truth. And now I'll pass you on to Will for our family time of Blend 10. Good morning, welcome to our blended activity this morning. As you'll see, I'm surrounded by trees and this morning's activity is using that idea of a family tree. Later in our service, Richard is gonna be talking to us about what it means to pass things down through the generations. And so this morning, what I'd love to encourage you to do is to create a family tree and it can have as many members of your family in as you want. You might want to write it, you might want to draw it, However you want to do it is absolutely fine. But the idea is that as you look at your family tree, I want you to note down things that have been passed through the generations. So it could be a physical feature, it might be the color of your eyes, or in my case, baldness. Um, it could be whatever physical features you want that have been passed down from different members of your family in the generations. Or it might be traits, character traits, certain habits, certain ways of being, certain ways of doing things, a certain sense of humor. Could be anything really. All I want to do is spend a few minutes talking about your family tree, writing it down and having to think what has been passed down through the generations to you and what do you pass down in the, to generations that go ahead of you. There's gonna be a countdown on the screen whilst you complete the activity. So are you ready? Go.
I hope you enjoyed doing that as a family tree activity. And as I say, Richard is going to speak to us later about what we pass on to generations and what has been passed on to us. So let's pray and then we're going to worship together. Dear Lord, we thank you for our families. We thank you for those that go before us and those that we get to pass things on to. Father, would you bless our time together this morning as we worship you? Amen. And so let's worship together. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You hid and glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. We didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down My sin was great, your love was greater What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a wonderful name it is Nothing compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a powerful name it is nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus death could not hold you the veil to be Silence the bows of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God. You reign. Yours is the kingdom. 
Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound Drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still And all alone No praise the name of the Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Son of heaven rose again Oh, trample death Where is your sting? The angels fall For Christ the King No praise the name of the Oh, 
Advent is a journey. It's a journey of movement forward. It's a journey of looking ahead with hope and expectation. It's a journey of uh, looking for the return of Jesus. As we prepare for Christmas, we think of his second coming. So Advent is a time of focus. It's a time of moving ahead forwards. So important at this time of year. It's a time too of being alert, being uh, ready for what's around the corner, what's coming up. As we prepare for Christmas, we also prepare ourselves for the second coming of Jesus, his return, the things that are ahead. It's a time of rushing forward into what God has for us and being alert to what is around us. So Advent this year for us, I think is going to be a very special season in the midst of all of this. A time of searching for God, a time of looking for what he's doing and a time of being ready and hungry for more of him. So we don't know if we'll be in lockdown or not, do we? But wherever we are, we're likely to be spending more time at home and we want to spend this time to grow deeper in God. Christmas is going to be about what can we do to reach our community, to share the love and the story of Jesus. For Advent is a time for us as disciples of Jesus to grow, to focus, to think, to reflect. So we're going to run a series of reflections every day by email or on Facebook, uh, just with a, like an Advent calendar of Bible verses and thoughts every day. Each day there will also be a link to a going deeper section, a blog or a video just to explore the truth a bit more. Just to give us a daily dose, a daily feed of God's truth through the Advent season. Advent starts on the 29th of November and will run till Christmas. We're also going to be having uh, a little chance to gather to pray in the morning or evenings, Monday to Thursday, 8am Monday, Wednesday, 8pm Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, through Advent, just a chance to connect and pray. We'd love you to join us for those. We'll send more details out by email, but look out for our Advent reflections. It's a great way for us to grow and focus on God in this season. This reading is taken from Exodus chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 14. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it, from the first day, until the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day hold a sacred assembly, and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it was the very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month you are to eat bread made without yeast, from the evening of the fourteenth day until the evening of the twenty-first day. For seven days no yeast is to be found in your houses, and whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is an alien or native-born. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, drip it in the, bud in the basin and put some of, a, of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes to the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions, a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land, the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does the ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt 
and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the last few months, this building has been empty most of the time. We gathered a few times, but by and large, we've not been able to gather here. We've had the joy of meeting with God in our homes, realizing we don't need to be in this building to meet with him, of course. But as we come towards Christmas, I'm sure for many of us, it's a place full of memories. And memories of great things that have happened here. The lights, the Christmas jumper competitions, the scratch nativities, the twinkling of candles, all those beautiful things and memories around Christmas. So how can we use our building well this Christmas? How can we use it to connect with our community and show them God's love afresh? We need to transform in our imagination how we use this building. We can't gather big crowds all at once, but what we can do is gather big crowds over a period of time. So I want you to imagine that from this, this place is gonna stop being a church building for big gatherings and become a nativity wonderland, a place where the story of Jesus can be explored through a trail. We're going to invite our community to come in from the 16th to the 24th of December in all ages, from children to people of all generations, to come and use this place for prayer and for discovery, for understanding what Jesus has done, to understand that Jesus came as a baby, to hear the story again. But also, we are allowed in this time to use it as a personal, private prayer space. Now, I don't know about you, but I find praying alone in a, in a cold building just doesn't really get me going. But we're going to set up a trail that becomes a prayer adventure for people to come and pray. It will all be COVID safe, so people come at one at a time. You can book a slot on Eventbrite. We want to tell your friends, your neighbours, we want the whole of Romilly to come and join in our Christmas Nativity Adventure Trail. There'll be activities for children at each station. There'll be a journey around the building and then finally focus here at this corner chapel with a space for the stable to reflect on who Jesus is. We're gonna need your help with this. First of all, we need egg boxes because everyone who comes is gonna build their own egg box nativity as they go around the trail. We're gonna need volunteers, an army of volunteers to host, to welcome, to oversee the audio, to clean down between each um, session, to keep the place tidy, to make those who come feel welcome. It's gonna be a wonderful opportunity for people of all ages to come and pray and come and learn about Jesus. So, look forward to it. The ways to sign up will be on the emails. Come and be a volunteer, keep saving your egg boxes, and then when it gets closer, tell your friends, tell them, get down to St. Chad's, join in the Christmas Nativity Adventure. The reading is taken from Numbers chapter 32. The Reubenites and Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks, saw that the lands of Jazer and Gilead were suitable for livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar, the priest, and to the leaders of the community, and said, Ataroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrod, Heshbon, Eliel, Sebon, Nebo, and Beon the land the Lord subdued before the people of Israel, are suitable for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Then they came to Moses and said, We would like to build pens here for our livestock, and cities for our women and children, but we will armour ourselves for battle and go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them up to their place. <clears throat> Meanwhile, our women and children will live in fortified cities, for protection from the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until each of the Israelites has received their inheritance. We will not receive any inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan, because our inheritance has come to us on the east side of the Jordan. 
Then Moses said to them, If you will do this, if you will arm yourselves before the Lord for battle, and if all of you who are armed cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies out before him, then when the land is subdued before the Lord, you may return and be free from your obligation to the Lord and to Israel. And this land will be your possession before the Lord. But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Build cities for your women and children, and pens for your flocks, but do what you have promised. The Gadites and the Reubenites said to Moses, We your servants will do as our Lord commands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me as we look at God's truth together. Lord God, speak to us through your truth today. Come and be with us as we consider your word and what it has to say to us. Amen. This month we've been looking at remembering and uh, the whole theme of remembrance and the importance of remembering to be rerouted in our story, who we are and the truth of God's love for us and the story that is deeper and longer that goes further back than the life we're living right now, the experience we're having. The final thing I want to look at on the series on remembering is shared memory and how we pass on memories to the next generation. And that's what we're going to look at today. On Monday morning, I sat down, opened my Bible, opened my notes, ready to start preparing this. And uh, I prepared the plan for the remembering back in um, September. And I, the question was, why on earth have I chosen number chapter 32 as the reading. I read it and reread it and thought, what is this obscure passage about the Reubenites who want to uh, pl plant themselves uh, east of the Jordan, whereas Joshua and the people want them to cross over and fight uh, against the people. Why are they um, arguing over this whole issue of the land and whether they do or don't fight for the Israelites when they conquer the land? And then I remembered uh, why I'd chosen it. I'd chosen this passage because there, it has within it a spot the difference. I want you to look at these two passages and spot the difference between them. Verse 16. Then they came up to him and said, we'd like to build pens here for our livestock and cities for our women and children. And then in verse 24, Moses says, build cities for your women and children and pens for your livestock, but do what you have promised. Did you see the difference? Did you spot the difference in the passage. The people of Reubenite's tribe want to build their pens first and then their cities for the women and children. Put their business and their property and their money-making possessions first and then family, women, children second. Moses turns it on his head with one of these moments we have in the Bible of change priorities. Put your family first, put your children first and your property second. Put your children first and your business and your money and your possessions second. There is a mandate throughout the Bible to value children and value the next generation. It's often said that we are only one generation from the extinction of the church. If we do not pass on the faith to the next generation, there will be no church. But for 2,000 years, the church has invested its truth in the next generation, in children, so that they may grow up to know the good news of Jesus and know the story of his life. And one of the key ways we do that, and the reason I'm addressing this subject now, is through festivals, through big events. Today is Advent Sunday, the beginning of the preparation season for Christmas, the beginning of that phase as we look forward to Jesus coming. And one of the things I want to focus on today is this season of Christmas is so important for sharing the faith with our children. The headlines over the last couple of weeks have been, is Christmas cancelled? Can, what can happen with Christmas? We're getting some clarity now from the government of what we will or won't be able to do, how many households we can meet with, what we can do. And one of the debates in there is, is well, can families meet? Can people gather to go to the pub together? But what about church services and religious services? Will we be able to worship together? In the midst of all that debate and priorities, it's all fascinating about our set of values. Part of this is the recognition that Christmas is a time to pass on the faith. It's not just a time to gather as families. As we gather, we share memories and we share remembrance to invest in our next generation. It's a crucial thing to have festivals every year as part of sharing the faith with our children. So 
For that, we're going to look at the model we have in Exodus chapter 12 of how the people of Israel passed on the faith about their crossing of the Red Sea to their children. And Passover for the Jews was like Christmas for us. It's the biggest festival of the year. And it actually, for them, focuses around a family meal, a meal of celebration, but a meal full of rich meaning and symbolism right after the moment of the plagues. Before they've even crossed the Red Sea, God gives these instructions about celebrating Passover for the years to come. He directs them about this festival. Remember the Passover. And how are they to remember it? Well, let's look at a few verses here. The first in our passage, verse 14. This day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. The first thing about festivals is that they are a celebration. They are a time of joy. They are a time of fun. They are a time of laughter and games, of good food, of good drinks, of good times together. A time to put aside the woes and the difficulties of the year and think about what is good. Think about what is fun. Enjoy ourselves. Because this ingrains within our children's hearts the fact that being part of a family, being part of celebrating God's goodness is to celebrate. It's not something to be dour or religious about, but to be something to be enjoyed. It goes on to say, as a lasting ordinance. The Jews watched the celebrated Passover every year. We celebrate Christmas every year. I've come to realise the importance of these rhythms, these patterns in our life. They come back whatever happens. This year is so different. Everything in our world has been different. We've been in lockdown. We've been uh, dealing with a pandemic. We've been dealing with a, such a big change. And yet Christmas comes round and it's still there. And it's still to be celebrated. And it's still a marker point in our year that points us to Jesus. And there's something really important about the rhythms of life, because it reminds us that what God is doing, God's story is bigger, even than a global pandemic. Thirdly, the passage then goes on to this whole section about unleavened bread and how they must not have any leaven and how the bread of unleavened. It's a capture for the people of Israel that they had to in a rush. They had to be ready and to go. But it became a massive deal, the unleavened bread. And in the passage, we read about the various aspects of the Passover, the hyssop and other things that they are to do. All of these are about the way that we pass on the faith to our children isn't just through words, isn't just through sermons, even though I'm preaching one now. It's through experiences, the experience of Christmas, the memories associated with it, link them into the story of Jesus. And for us, these are just in this one shot, we have two nativity scenes. Our house is full of nativity scenes because they remind us that Jesus is the centre of it all. Our Christmas trail we're going to be doing in the church building is all about helping our community come and experience the reality, the wonder of zooming in and focusing in on Jesus. And the shepherds and the wise men and the sheep and the star and the innkeeper is all pointing to Jesus, the story of Jesus. We really want people to have profound encounters with Jesus this Christmas. But sometimes the very seeds of who he is start with that sense of that Christmas is so important because he is so valuable. So let our investment in the next generation, helping them remember, be, be something that they can touch and taste and see and experience. And the Jewish Passover had symbolic meals. Maybe you have traditions in your family. Do you ever explain them to your children? Do you have uh, tradition becomes just a hollow religious empty thing when it's not explained. But when it's explained, when the symbolism of why it's there, what it's about becomes real. And it becomes a beautiful thing that passes on the story down the generations. Wow. We look at verse 16. Do no work on all of these days. For festivals, work stops. And that's true for us, isn't it? For many of us. Uh, Christmas is a time when we down tools and we stop. But we now live in a 24-7 world. We live in a world with, of emails and WhatsApps, of home internet. Many of us have been working from home and Christmas will be at home. And the, the, the office or the laptop will be just over there, tempting just to check that email, just to do that bit of work, to keep just pop away. What really speaks loud and clear to our children is when we do no work and put them before our work, our possessions, our finances, those things. Yes, a lot of our work for many of us as parents is ultimately to bless and benefit them. We need to work to buy them presents and to give them the, the things they enjoy. But if we are so preoccupied with work 
that we cannot be present to our children? What do we pass on them? What message are we subtly giving them? And I think this year all the more, because for many of us, work and home have been more intertwined and we need to really separate ourselves and stop work, down tools, do no work, be present. Back to what it said in Numbers, um, don't do your pens first and then the cities for your families. Do your families first and then tend to your livestock and your possessions second. Really important that we take time to spend with our family because that leads into our final thing in verse 26 at the end of the passage. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. What will really make the difference for our children growing and understanding and remembering the story of God will be training them, equipping them to ask questions. It's part of the Passover system was that the children would ask the question. And the question that became part of the, the ritual, the routine of the evening. But where do we take time to let our children ask us questions or our grandchildren ask us questions? And how do we respond when they do? There's so much value in encouraging children to ask questions. Now, when they're two or three and they ask why 500 times a day, yes, it gets tiring. But if we don't answer, they will stop asking. And one of the tragedies that happens to people is when they stop asking questions because they stop seeking understanding. And the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs and in Psalms and in Jesus's parables of the seed that an inquiring, hungry to learn, inquisitive mind is open to wisdom. And a fixed, closed, I know already are not interested mind is a tragedy. When your children ask what this means, tell them. Talk to them, tell them stories, spend time with them. And grandparents and aunts and uncles and godparents do the same. One of the things our children need to grow in wisdom and understanding and to receive the faith passed on from us is us to really listen to them. And children, if you're watching this, if you're still listening, ask questions, ask difficult questions, raise questions. Don't be too shy to ask questions. Have that hunger to learn. How do we encourage that in children when we listen and we pray. One of the things I often pray for people, I pray for my neighbours, I pray for our family and friends, I to pray for our hungry, inquisitive heart. Let's pray that for our children and grandchildren and godchildren and nieces and nephews and all those who are younger than us, who we have a connection with, that they would grow with a hunger, a desire to learn, because we have a call to pass on the good faith of God to the next generation through stopping work, through valuing family and through encouraging questions. I pray that this Christmas, God would sow seeds in the hearts of our families, our friends, our children of our community that will bear fruit in years to come. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For the kingdom power. And the glory are yours. Forever and ever. Amen. Well, we now come to the end of our service and I hope that you have been blessed this morning by joining with all the saints of St Chad's and all that have gone in the past. So our pray as we go. God of power and mercy, open our hearts to welcome. Remove the things that hinder us from receiving Christ with joy so that we can share in his wisdom and become one with him when he comes in glory. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray, Lord, that we will be a blessing to our families and those beyond. Amen. So have a great week. I hope to see some of you on the Coffee Zoom chat today at 12, and we'll see you soon.